so it's, it's really wonderful to be here in Shenzhen and uh. see all that's going on um, around the electronics industry. Uh, do you see more companies coming here to start up? Oh yeah, oh Jesus. It's like, yeah, there's like an incubator, like coming, you know, starting every, every other day. Like, it's like, I feel like everyone in the grandma is starting a hardware accelerator out here. So. Sure, and so um, what do you think some of the benefits are um, uh, to doing that here? <clears throat> um, I think there's uh, like the benefit to, I guess, actually, so the ben having an accelerator out here is, is I think good, but you know, the main benefit really is kind of uh, contacts and like guidance on the manufacturing process. Because actually, I feel like, you know, Shenzhen, or more properly Dongguan, is the, the manufacturing you know, the, ma the manufacturing, the factory of the world almost. So almost everything gets manufactured in this area, the Pearl River Delta. And, uh, and so like a lot of people are coming here and they're, you know, cause there's like all this talk about Shenzhen, Shenzhen, and then they come here and then they're like, okay, now what do I do? And then ma basically they just go to the Huachang Bay markets. Um, and the components there are really cheap and you can source them, but uh, there's also another layer, which is like dealing with the manufacturers and the factories. And so, um, so that's when things get kind of uh, more difficult. So like a lot of people, maybe they just come off a successful Kickstarter. They come out here and then they, they generally need a lot of help. So um, actually, I think a lot of the accelerators around here, they, I feel like they're kind of grooming people to do a proper Kickstarter, which means that they're not really kind of focused on manufacturing so much. Sure. Like, if you, once you get into manufacturing, then I think you, you need to start talking to factories, and you, you probably need to find people you trust, like a contract manufacturer that can like kind of integrate all the factories and help you uh, build up the connections. Like, so, but normally, I think if you want to make something out here, so, like, you have a design you want made, and so probably you would need to come up with, like, say, the enclosure design files, like, so, like, in a parametric modeler, like uh, SolidWorks. And then you'd have to start talking to plastic injection molding companies to get the tooling started. And then so, like, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And along with that, then you have to start the P talking to the PCB house, you know, and then, like, getting, like, kind of a hobby PCB made is much different than getting, like, kind of a professional PCB made because there's so many other things that you have to start thinking about. Like, you know, um, because, you, you know, you need to start thinking about production issues and quality and reliability and like even whether or not you want to put solder mask over your vias or not will make a difference on your reliability. So, and then the, and the PCB manufacturers will ask you those questions. Like, do you want tinted vias? Do you want tinted on one side? Do you want tinted on both sides? Do you want your, your vias plugged? You're just like very like tiny details. And then, um, and then and you have to coordinate all of that. And then along with that, then you have to start like kind of sourcing all the parts, you know, getting ready for, manu getting ready for PCB assembly, make sure all the plastic injection molding is going okay, and then start building up the logistics and how to get it out to sure. wherever you want. So then like all, there's all of these, this whole like line of things. And that's, that's called like, <clears throat> That's, that's called the manufacturing and supply chain, and then that's the area that you know, people come out here to try and learn, but it actually takes a long time. Maker Camp started a week before Maker Faire, and the idea was to bring 20 people from all over China to learn how to transform a container into a makerspace and then actually use it to prototype projects and involve the local community. And what kind of projects were they prototyping during the week? Um, they've done a lot of different projects. Um, they had a project where they were monitoring air pollution because that's a big problem uh, in China. Uh, they also had like fun projects, like they made, they transformed the container into a dating uh, game. So they wanted uh, the container to make sounds when people come and touch it at the same time. Do you find um, the problem with forming these, these communities and, and showing this way of teaching and learning is there isn't a space for people to congregate at? Or is that really more of a mechanism to get the community to coagulate around something? It's more of a mechanism. I personally think that it's not about the space, it's about the people. Um, a lot of times, uh, if the people build the space and they take ownership and they get to express themselves and what they want to build in the way they organize the space, 
uh, that creates a very different culture. Uh, it gives them agency and they take ownership over the project and that's the goal. It wouldn't matter if we do a house tree or a container, but containers are easier to find. Well, I think that brings up an interesting question. You, we have such a big social difference with the maker and hacker community. Mm -hmm. In China, I think the previous um, uh, run of Maker Camp was in Europe. Yes. Um, what are some of the um, differences that surprised you between the two groups? Oh my god, there are so many. <laughs> Um, I think in the camp in Berlin we had uh, more time, we had one month. Really? Okay. Yes, and um, the participants were a bit younger as well, and we all spoke the same language, which made a big difference. However, the easiest thing in Berlin was that we could just walk on the street and find pallets and wood, and we made a poster saying, if you have tools that you don't use, please bring it to us, and people actually brought us tools. We managed to build everything with zero budget in Berlin. Um, that wasn't possible here because uh, even if we found bamboo on the street, someone else would take it. Like, nothing is for free in China. I think it's really hard to find materials, reuse, upcycle. Um, I, and that was like one of the things I didn't expect at all. Um, and I think also, like, the biggest cultural difference is the difference between being used to receive guidance and instructions and follow a guide. Uh, compared to what we did in Berlin where it was, okay, uh, we have this container, there's a box, let's make a plan, who wants to do this, who wants, and they self-organized. And the idea of the camp was that they would self-organize. Sure. Um, they managed to do that here as well, after like the initial three days, but right. it, was, it was a process to get them to understand that no one will tell them what to do. So it's, uh, it sounds like um, you don't need to go through an accelerator to have access to that, but it, it's a bigger mountain to climb. Uh, I think, yeah, you don't need to go through an accelerator for that. Like, an accelerator, I think, would probably be good to give you money, maybe some tools, and some... Uh, I think Accelerator is really good to groom people with an idea and maybe a functional prototype into a successful, like, Kickstarter campaign. So they, they really work on, on, like, the pitch and, like, kind of, you know, a lot of... Uh, like and presentation and the video and uh, all that and uh, but for the factory advice I think talking to the Kickstarter alumni is probably the most like one of their most most important uh, the Hackcelerator alumni is their most important asset actually because they've gone through the whole manufacturing process and then right now uh, Bunny and I were teaching the uh, MIT Media Lab uh, manufacturing program uh, summer program, which is like a six-week course on how to, like, how to get things manufactured, and we're taking them to the factories and having them actually manufacture uh, plastic uh, injection molding tooling, um, professional PCBs, you know, and just going through that whole process, because we think that as designers, it's important to keep the manufacturing, like, in your head as you design, rather than as an afterthought when you finish the design. So are you actually able to carry through the entire process in six weeks, or do you kind of take some shortcuts? There, we did, like, a, like there were a lot of shortcuts that were made. Um, so Bunny had actually prepared all the tooling in advance, and so like when they submit their tooling, they start with the base file, and they're just going to uh, have one area modified. Okay. And so a lot of that will just be, like, you know, like, part of, like, the tooling will just be uh, remachined, and, like, a little piece taken, shaven off. So then it can be done in like just a couple days. Whereas generally, if you do uh, injection molding tooling, I think it's around a two to three month lead time in order to get like the steel, the steel machined and then, and then put into the mold frame. So it sounds like proximity is one of the things that being in Trinjun and starting up uh, is really good. Are there any things that are harder if you're here? Uh, yeah, like uh, if you don't speak Chinese, you probably need to start uh, hanging out with a translator or something. <laughs> um, most factories like can speak, uh, well, they have somebody that speaks Chinese that they'll, uh, they'll do translation, but also you might want to have someone that you trust kind of like going along with you and like kind of to ease the, you know, to ease like the conversation, especially when you talk about detailed specifications. And, uh, and like if you go to the markets, then you'll need somebody to like uh, you might need somebody to translate for you. Actually, you can just pretty much point and, and write down a price on a calculator and then, you know.
it's like for <coughs> companies to get started in Hong Kong and maybe what advantages people might find by uh, you know working here? Yeah, well, uh, Hong Kong is really, uh, I think everyone knows it's the most free environment for business, generally speaking. So it's very easy to set up a company. It takes really a couple of hours if you have a e-certificate of yourself. Otherwise, it's a question of a week. All this done. Now it's getting a bit more complicated to open a bank account. They check where, where you're from and whatever. You, everyone can imagine with the restriction control on <coughs> money laundry issues that happened recently or whatever. So the, 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 the system is checking a bit more, but it's still a question of days. And for what about the real setup? I mean, regardless the, 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 the paperwork. Starting up in here is quite easy. There are several uh, incubators programs that help young people to, to, to kick off. Uh, I have to say honestly, there are difficulties at the stage, financial state immediately up the, up, after the seeding finance. So whatever is after an uh, incubator is kind of difficult to, to find money for that stage in here because investors are still quite traditional. I mean, those, uh, that those investors that look at, look, usually look at the company that has, is not, not seed mm -hmm. and no VC stage in, in sure. there is, are parents or small investors, people of the uh, circle you choose to work in, like education, and then you have a startup in education and you look for some people with money in that field, or you start up in IT and you, you, you look around in the, in the field of the IT, and that, that kind of investor is a bit, still a bit difficult in here, to be fun, but there are people coming from the States and from Singapore, so you need to be actually in the loop of these co-working spaces or, or, or events arranged by Science Park and Cyberport, and you can find stuff. And after that, <clears throat> again, it's still very traditional from my point of view. I'm, as I told you before, I'm a f kind of finance guy, so I know what I'm talking about. And I can see here people love to invest in the stock market or uh, big companies, or uh, if they invest in something, directly as a family, let's say a couple of million of Hong Kong dollar in something, they won't overtake the whole control of the thing. So it doesn't really match the mind settings of an of a entrepreneur at that stage immediately after the seed. It's a bit difficult. Do you think that that's going to change this? It's changing, okay. but I honestly can say I, I, I have been here for a while. This is really hard to be changed okay. in the mind of the local people. I can see a change may be brought by people coming from outside that want to fill in this, this, this gap. Once you do find a factory that you want to work with, what's it like to build a relationship with them? Um, so I think that's probably the most important part of being out here. So uh, the general rule of thumb, and I think it's what uh, and and uh, Bun Bunny's actually philo actual philosophy is that if you can't if you can't drink with the boss, like if you can't hang out with the boss, then then that factory is probably not right for you. Because like uh, there's so many when you're in mass production, or actually when you're uh, going into production, also there's so many problems that can happen and that will happen. And sometimes you'll need to be able to get things done quickly. And you need to have access to the boss, the factory, the factory boss, in order to get that pushed through. And uh, so you'll need a good relationship with the factory boss. And that means like kind of hanging out. There's a lot of people talk about the drinking that goes on here. A lot of that is just to show face and also just to build up more trust and, uh, and a relationship with, uh, with, uh, with, with people, including the, the people you manufacture with. Two and a half years ago, Bunny and I were like kind of drunk at a bar in Japan, and he's like, you know, it'd be it'd be cool if we just like spent you know a whole month doing factory tours for like you know you know for like for students to teach them because they don't understand you know like what you know manufacturing is all about. You know, there's a lot of designers in the world that don't understand manufacturing, and then I was like, you know, that'd be cool. You know, I'd want to you know I'd want to do that too, and then I totally forgot about it, but like. Six months later, Bunny's like, you know, hey, I set up that tour. Do you want to come? And then, <laughs> so that was about two years ago, and that was the first um, Shenzhen, uh, the Media Lab Shenzhen tour. 
And uh, out of that, actually, probably the biggest success was um, Bunny and GT started working on circuit stickers, and then that turned into like kind of a company that like you know, and G became exposed to all of the, the whole manufacturing chain, and 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 she was originally so like young and innocent, and then now she's like, oh, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. Like, <laughs> you need to call this person and talk, have them talk to this boss, and then it's like it's very, it was very interesting to see that. Are there, are there challenges or benefits to starting them in China? Well, obviously, if you start them from Shenzhen, you have access to an incredible uh, supply chain. And so, you know, we were able to price this new Genuino Uno incredibly aggressively uh, because here the supply chain, it's, you know, you literally walk down the street and you get every single thing you need, parts, assembly people, test people. So you have everything locally. And so I think this is very important. And clearly, if you want to build hardware, this is one of the places where you want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, also because the image that people have about China is in like a factory in the middle of nowhere where people sleep on the floor, I don't think that's Shenzhen. Yeah. Shenzhen is about people with qualification, people who are engineers, who do very good quality. You know, this is the first Arduino, so in a way, Gen Genuino that came out of the factory here. It is very good quality. So I think it's about turning the made in China into proudly made in China. This is for the Chinese market. So what are your feelings on engineering in China? If people are here um, starting companies, can they find talent to help them get past the problems in their design and, and manufacture process? So what we know, what I can see right now is that in Shenzhen, they can find everything about hardware. They, they can find it here. Good engineers, good manufacturing, everything. They can find everything here. I've been told that they can find less people that know about software, but I think that's changing because Tencent is one of the buildings around here, yeah. and they have this WeChat with hundreds of millions of users, so the software is coming. And what I think we need now is to work with them on the more creative side. I think the government here is really pushing on making Maker something that people understand about because it's one of the ways you can create the creative companies, the one that invent the product here. Yeah instead of just somebody comes here and manufactures here. So you will be able to find designers and other creative uh, people here in the next few years. In Hong Kong, there's a lot of um, high-tech uh, uh, places and uh, that's one reason I come, came back from Vancouver to Hong Kong to, uh, for work. Uh, science, science Park, Cyberport and uh, some other places for makers. Mm -hmm. So uh, if people like to come to Hong Kong, first things visit us, Dim Sum Lab, and uh, we will tell you more about uh, what's, what's, what, kind of uh, what kind of place you can stay and then uh, uh, how to make stuff. And especially it's good to make prototype because uh, we're in Hong Kong, so um, if you want to make a PCB, all you need a schematic, a bomb, and that's it. And people can actually help you to order parts to make the PCB, solder them together, and give you back. So uh, no hassle, it's easy. So that's what the, the cyber park is? They have... Um... No, no, it's... Actually, I do the part-time job. But uh, in, <laughs> in cyber port, it's for a place for rental. Okay. Like uh, for people, they want to uh, get a place to, to work on this stuff. Okay. So yeah, Cyberport and Science Park is supported by government. Okay. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cheap for the first year. And yeah. what kind of size? I mean, how many of these different uh, small companies are, are in Cyberport? Well, a lot. Yeah. I guess about more than a hundred. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cyberport and Science Park. Yeah. If you have time, that go visit Science Park. It's a nice place. Yeah. Yeah high-tech, it look high-tech. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what people is doing, doing inside. But um, people go in, at least they have a place to, to work on and then uh, they get sponsorship for marketing and sales. And uh, yeah, a lot of sponsorship in Hong Kong. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you notice um, companies starting locally rather than people moving here to start a company? Is there a growing movement for local? Uh, local company, there's uh, 3D display. There's a company uh, doing the 3D displays, um, um, a company working on 
oil spill, like a, like um, protect the ocean from oil spill. Um, some people working on humanoid robot for hobbyists, and uh, some people working on uh, two wheels, uh, wheelchair for uh -huh. disabled. So there's a lot of things um, work uh, going on in Hong Kong, but I guess it's the media they don't like like uh, get much. They, they don't get much attention from the sure. public. So uh, I guess it's the awareness in Hong Kong because it, Hong Kong people like to make money instead of make stuff. But yeah. you, you never know, like the culture will change sometimes. Yeah. So how rapidly changing is this? Like if you learn I need to go through this process, is it going to be relevant a month, a year, five years from now? Um, I think like the, you know, the, the tooling and the manufacturing technology might change, but I think, um, but like when you manufacture, you, you, the main, the main difficulty is probably uh, the human issues, like dealing with humans and dealing with people. And so I feel like that's kind of, you know, that's like a big part of the education is to get, to have the students see how we work with the bosses, how we drink with the bosses, and also like kind of, and see how, and, and we, we don't force any of the students to, you know, drink. You know, they just they eat they eat with us. But, you know, if they want if they want to, uh, like, hang out, like, you know, then, then, then this, that's fine too. So, so I, I get the impression that um, China has a very rapidly evolving culture right now. Uh -huh. uh, does that make um, the years that you've been uh, coming to Shenzhen? Do you, do you feel a big change in culture? I feel like Shenzhen is changing. Shenzhen is becoming like um, they're trying to rapidly evolve it and then show a lot of, you know, like these beautiful buildings and like kind of very industrial thing. But I feel like underneath all that, so that I feel like is kind of like the glazed coating, you know, like the, the paint. And then if you look underneath that paint, then you still see like the hard, gritty things like the Huachang Bay components markets and uh, all the factories out in Dongguan. And I, all of that stuff is really what this place is all about. And that's what keeps everything going. You know, it's interesting. We did go to the markets the other day, and there's like one brand new building. But when you walk in, you get the yeah. feeling that the building was like built around this existing set of booths. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, actually, the, the, the Huachang Bay markets are very dynamic. But yeah, it's like all the. So like in this area, it's all these beautiful buildings, but I just can't really understand it because it's so far away from where everything is really happening. And you go, yeah. And then like in, in Hua Chong Bay, they do have buildings coming up, but then they all end up, no matter how beautiful they are on the outside, you go inside and it's just a bunch of people smoking and like babies like kind of crawling around and people throwing stuff on the floor and just a lot of money changing hands very fast. So um, the sound of packing tape <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if this is something that has kind of come on like a freight train because the internet is opening up options or has it always uh, been like this? Uh, I think it's always been like that. Um, so like there's one area which is just, so they're, they're all, most of the packing tape you're hearing is because they're shipping, uh, because actually yeah, Taobao, Taobao is getting bigger and so like they have like a lot of the independent shippers okay. and so they're like packing the things up. But um, yeah, at the same time, they've always been like, like Shenzhen is a trade city, and so there's always been kind of like an export economy here. And so a lot of people source their parts and just have them shipped out. But that being said, there's actually, what's really changing is the shipping technologies. So now there's like some places where like, um, like if, you, if you're doing uh, maybe like a parts shop out here, then, you know, or like Ian doing uh, dirty PCBs, then, um, like he gets a lot of customers all over the world and basically he just has like a label printer, prints all the PC, you know, prints labels for all the boxes and then he takes them to a shipping logistics provider and then they just, they just ship by the weight, by weight. So they just weigh it and then take it all and then they just like sort it out and ship it to wherever country it needs to go. And so there's, there's no like kind of thought about, you know, oh, this individual tracking number, this, all this stuff. It's just like, boom, here it is, weighs this much, you pay this much, and then sorted.
I think the, the, the most important things that you can find here if you are coming from the US, like or for or from 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 Europe. Well, if you come from the US, here is cheaper to start up. Valet is very expensive. Mm -hmm. We have people in here, they are thinking to step into the valet after they start up in here mm -hmm. and it's still expensive. Yeah. They do it because they know that in there is easier to find investors. Sure. They can fulfill that gap that in here cannot be fulfilled because there are no people willing to go, as I said, from the seed to that. Yeah, so here it's more traditional. Pretty big it's a little round. bit easier yeah. to get the funding. In. And, and, and for water, yes, at that second stage. But yeah. you can start up in here where it's easier and cheaper. Sure. So do you see a lot of companies doing that? Like they, they start right here and then as soon as they get to that next level, they move because they have to. They, 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 not a lot of companies are doing that, but it's a kind of common strategy okay. uh, to think about doing so. Uh, and is as I said, it's still expensive to do it in the U.S. So not everyone can do it because they can't raise the money they need to do that, take that step. For European people willing to start up is even better because in Europe actually they they do a lot of talking about startuping or whatever, but they do it governments, institutions, or whatever because they don't know how to offer a job. They, there is no there are no jobs in there. So the only thing they can fit the guys with is, ah, you need to start up, it's cool to start up or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but no, no funding are working, Pro probably in the UK, I don't know, I don't have direct experience, but I, I, I ran away a long ago, so I can say, and I have my brother doing, running a good business in there, and for him it's every day a trouble, even though he is running the company of the family, it's like 50 years of history, it was still tough, <laughs> so you can imagine for a guy that get out of the university have an idea, or based on an algorithm and some theory, put together friends, want to build up an app, they need 10,000 euro, they can't really find it anywhere. Yeah. So if they come over here, well, with a good idea, you can easily get that money. And let's say up to 5,000 euro, talking in European way, or 500,000 Hong Kong dollar, more or less, let's say, is not that difficult to find in here, to start up. If you go into an incubation program, you work hard, and you, 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 you bring some, I mean, you achieve the, the, the targets you put yourself, and you fulfill what you put in the business plan, and it, it can be done. get to the point where you can read and understand the schematics, but then to get a pool of schematics that everyone can look at and exactly. use is the choke point. Right exactly. There. And that's what they have here. They call it the Shanzai, Shanzai PCBs. Like all the people in Huachang Bay, they share the schematics. That's why you see so many innovative cop copycats and like all the boards are some, somehow similar because they use the same schematics and then they adapt it a little bit. They add something. And I think the the barrier between copy and something new becomes very blur. Mm -hmm. um, and that will also happen if we manage to create new uh, sustainable models, like new business models uh, that are not based on copyright. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's a little bit difficult here is um, open hardware. Like, is it possible to start an open hardware company in China and develop a market for it in China? Uh, I think by by default, yeah, China is already open. <laughs> it's uh, and then it's like involuntarily open. So you know, like trade secrets don't really mean that much here. People will just take your uh, designs and reverse engineer them, and then uh, and then like generate the schematics off of them. Like you know, uh, and like patents don't really mean anything. So like, you know, like. Like uh, actually, if you and then if you work with like say you you take a lot of time to build this beautiful enclosure, then um, then like there's so many injection molding houses they'll just take take it apart you know just take some calipers start measuring it and they'll just come up with a SolidWorks file like on the fly and they they do so much of they do so much work with like SolidWorks and uh, and and plastics that you know they can just like reverse engineer uh, enclosures just really quickly as well and electronics very quickly too. Uh, so if you know that's going to happen, how do you build a business around the design? Um, I think, like, uh, I don't like how. How do you? Uh, no, I, I'm actually like I'm just trying to think like because how do you build a business around open hardware? Because like so if it's voluntarily open, 
you know, and then how do you build a business? And so, like, you know, you how do you capture the value? Like, I think it's a lot of it is, like, like what what China doesn't do well is build community, like building communities abroad. <laughs> so I feel like you know, like, like a lot of the open hardware businesses, it's not really that they sell uh, like unique components. Is that they're like their whole, they built such a interesting community. Like Adafruit has just a huge community that they work so hard that Lamore and Phil have worked so hard to build up that I think that's really kind of their their business power that's driving their business, I think. And so, you know, that's, you know, the, I feel like the product is just a, sm a tiny part and there's like, there's uh, support and uh, community instruction, like things like that. That all I, actually, I believe, really sells. So is there the potential to do that in China to build a really dedicated community um, and, or has someone already been doing that? Uh, I think, I think um, they already have like, I, I think they already have like a very strong kind of uh, hardware community in China, like China is a manufacturing country, so you know, so in fact I feel like China's uh, manufacturing and hardware skills far outweigh their kind of software development skills. So uh, for open hardware I think they're still kind of getting used to the idea like that it's voluntarily open, um, and so a lot of a lot of places would be like kind of yeah, they still like trying like, you know, like you know, don't take pictures of this. Or, Universities are pushing more guys to be uh, think about an, an, entrepreneur, temp, an entrepreneurial idea rather than find a job in a big firm. Yeah. Because the mind settings of the guy also here is a trouble, let's say trouble. Uh, because they study push by the family to find a job in a big firm. Mm -hmm. This is the main the general way Hong Kongis work, okay. uh, I mean, d deal with uh, their future. I study hard and I get into a big corporation. I study hard IT and I get into Microsoft, Cisco, whatever. Study finance, I get into banks or, or uh, management consulting firm, whatever. So this is actually the, the, the mind setting. So tell them, okay, no big firm. Set up something by yourself or with few friends. Sometimes the family oppose this idea. Okay. And then I always say there is another, pro another issue in here that um, Asian people have troubles in facing failures and losing yeah. face. And this is really, really a very strong uh, stop sign because oh, yeah. you, you, f you find really you can't, you can't do it inside yourself. You don't want people to know that you, you invest y you yourself first. I mean, your efforts, your power, your energy in something that didn't work. Yeah. How do people get over that? How, how I mean, how do you overcome that cultural norm of like failure is is horrible? Fail, failure is bad. Well, on my point of view, uh, is easier if you 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 did good a couple of times, mm -hmm. then you well with they yeah you are on an interview or on a stage and you're a successful businessman and then you can say well yeah but I also did fail you know guys, yeah. but. Um, is something that is very difficult for them actually to overcome. Huh. It's extremely difficult because they also don't have example. If you fail, uh, you are out of the market, let's say. Huh. So you're, the first example of, of a, a, a kid has probably is his father. And yeah. he's, the kid grown up looking at the father as an idol of perfection in here. So, so he never fail, I can't fail. And the best way not to fail is not to get engaged in something and or get into something that is already running. So right. so is failure can be managed. I mean, you you uh, you didn't get the promotion. Well, the promotion has to come to me. I, I, yeah. I is not written. And if, if I fulfill a test, then I get the promotion right. in, in inside the company. Sure. So I think it's very tough and it's really a big issue. Yeah. And, it, and I think it's really very difficult to to change it because there are historical proof that uh, this part of the world has problems in overcoming even very, very, very old uh, situation of losing face, losing reputation or whatever. So this, uh, this is, is a bit a, bit a trouble. 
I, I think that the interaction between Western and, 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 and locals is a bit is making things a bit more easy mm -hmm. because maybe we fell together mm -hmm. and then we stand up again together. It seems like, you know, just from the Maker Fair, there's like so many things. That I feel like a lot of it's opening up. So, you know, the, the really big thing that I feel that's happening is there's a lot more like a lot more hacker spaces and maker spaces popping up. So that's really that's really interesting. And I think that will spur a lot of open hardware. Uh, so you've been to a lot of hacker spaces and maker spaces. Are the, uh, um, is the kind of community inside of those uh, new China uh, spaces similar to others, or is it uh, a unique thing? I I haven't been to a lot of hacker spaces out here. Like the person to talk to really would be probably like uh, Mitch Altman, who's I think he's just traveled to like just so many of the hacker spaces around China, sure. and then uh, and also yeah, and there's a big government push behind the hacker spaces, which I personally you know like I don't like hacker spaces that have government sponsorship, but um, but I think it is interesting that that's happening. So they're like, mm -hmm. so that's accelerating a lot of the growth. Um, when are we gonna get to the point where we have enough in education that that's happening? Do you have any feeling? It's hard to say. When I started Hackademia three years ago, I thought in a year I'm gonna mm -hmm. reach, uh, you know, like a thousand schools and we're gonna, like I, I had really big plans and now I realize how real change is incremental mm -hmm. and takes a lot of time sure. and the more we try to rush it the harder it becomes um, so now I know I'm invested in this at least for 10 years. Is it possible to, to build a, a hackerspace or is that a, like a, a community and of people that, that then has a physical space built around them? So that's a really so that's a really interesting question so I think I'm working on my fourth or fifth hackerspace now like that's the one in Dromsala. and then um, I when I first started doing hackerspaces, I thought it was like about, you know, I I thought it was about the space at first, and then after that, then I thought it was about the equipment, you know, and now I finally realized that a hackerspace really is just about yeah the the people and having interesting projects, and you know you can have like almost no equipment, but if you have like the right people and interesting projects then those will attract more people, which will do more interesting projects, and you build up a feedback loop. And so um, I think right now there's so much emphasis on like all these expensive tools and like, you know, like, like la 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 laser cutters and 3D printers and CNC machines. But I really feel like, you know, you just need a bunch of motivated people doing like really interesting things, and then you can pretty much like, and then that would be a successful hackerspace. The city is so big, like it's 17 million people, and it was uh, built in 25 years. Like 25 years ago, this was a fisherman village. So I think we can't even start to begin to understand what's going on in Shenzhen and in China, and very little people do, which is the problem. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what will happen with innovation and the maker movement in China. Um, I'm here to observe as much as I can. Uh, and uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. So as the people that have gone through your programs grow up and start their own companies, is this the place that they want to be to, to work on those things, and why? Um, I think this is one of the places where it's easy to start, uh, but I think the places where they could have most impact are in the north or in the countryside. Um, I think it would be great for them to come here, learn as much as they can, uh, get the connections to get parts or tools delivered, but then go to the countryside or go to their province and start something there. Um, and a lot of them want to do that, which is encouraging, um, because people need to have a, a livelihood and a connection to the place where they're living. Um, and I, I don't expect everyone in China to move to, to this region, so I think it, it would be important to, to take that into account. Uh, and of course, there are many other political implications for displacing people or for, um, and they're all affected by it and it's visible. Um, and when we, when we talk about maker movement, we shouldn't forget about our attachment to the place where we come from and what we identify with. And um, that this maker movement was born from that connection to the local community. Um, and I think in Shenzhen, the, the feeling of local community is more justified by access to technology or access to electronics 
but not necessarily by a pool of common values or motivations. Mm -hmm. Great. I don't think you're gonna get this from other people.